I'm Oscar Ramirez. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Startup Commons. And together with me today, we have uh, Valto Loikanen on the stage, our senior advisor for ecosystem development and related digital solutions. So this webinar we are about to start is a continuation of another one we did last February, uh, in which basically we presented the foundational layer for the technology architecture that is key to operate and orchestrate any startup ecosystem. We, I would say, intentionally kept the presentation at a high level uh, to help navigate our audience in this transition from manually to digitally ecosystem development. And today uh, we are going to dig a little deeper and we are presenting uh, the underlying components of any digital ecosystem project. So you will get to know what is ecosystem OS stack, why the technology stack is important, the tools that are part of the uh, ecosystem OS stack and more. Uh, my colleague, Balto, uh, will cover all these topics during the webinar. And we really hope you find it again valuable for your ecosystem development efforts especially for those looking at removing ecosystem fragmentation and, and data fragmentation. Balto, the floor is yours, please. All right, so let's get started. So today we're gonna focus on the tools of ecosystem OS and specifically looking at uh, what ecosystem OS tech stack uh, include for ecosystem orchestration. So my name is Walter Leukkanen and I'm the senior advisor here in uh, uh, DGLA and Startup Commons. And uh, so let's get started. So as the main thing, uh, one of the key things that we first want to start with is why are we doing the ecosystem OS uh, tech stack? <clears throat> and what are the, the kind of the key uh, what is the one key aspect that we really want to kind of pay attention before we take a deeper dive? So <clears throat> one of the key challenges in, uh, in the field of any uh, digital solutions, building digital transformation, application development, and so forth, is basically the gap that exists uh, between those who have the, the business logic and product ownership uh, those who understand the markets, the customers, the business processes, and all other related things related to business logic. And then those <clears throat> who have the technical capabilities to build the solutions, um, uh, whether those, whatever technologies th those may be, and, um, and so forth. So typically, uh, this communication gap between uh, these two sides uh, is the maturity of the reason for extended budgets, the, the de de delays on the deliveries, and simply being able to communicate um, the type of process or functions that should be uh, developed into the product and so forth. So from, from that, this point of view, we, we feel that our, one of our biggest uh, focus and contributions for this is to really take everything that we create and communicate as part of ecosystem OS into front and center to help bring, um, to help reduce the gap and help improve the communication between these uh, uh, two main disciplines. And of course, in the mix of all of that is typically a design that functions in converting the business logic into uh, things that uh, resemble the application, whether it's uh, data model design, whether that is um, user interface design, uh, and process design, and so forth. Um, the the shorter we can make this the, the, this gap, or smaller we can make it, um, that directly contributes to uh, speed of speed of delivery and smaller budgets um, for. Um, for ecosystem digitalization or digital ecosystems. At the best case scenario, you can imagine these types of things being developed uh, with those uh, leading companies like Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, who actually compose the both of these 
disciplines inside one brain and therefore can be extremely efficient in thinking, designing and putting things into practice at scale. So at, at best, what we recommend uh, is definitely that all the teams working should, there should be an internal team uh, that co composes, whether it's a board member level, whether that's operational level or whether that's <coughs> management level that composes both of these disciplines um, that have high trust with each other and can uh, effectively collaborate. Because of course, having things in more than one brain is always better than just uh, risking all in, in that sense. But nevertheless, this is one of the key focus areas for, for us. And as part of this and related to this, we have actually come up with um, uh, one of the terminology uh, that we, we are going to be using effectively throughout uh, our communication to highlight one of the, the key aspects to kind of uh, there's so many things and bits and pieces going on in the tech stack as a whole uh, in any application as such or any application creation process or any uh, any aspect of designing back-end data models front-end or whatnot and we call this uh, minimum logical element uh, short uh, MLE um, basically to describe in each of the disciplines what is the smallest possible unit of bundled items that make logical sense and gives enough context when combined together, specifically when these are looked from together from business designers and developers perspective. So it's basically a, a type of element uh, in any of the, the areas that need to be worked on that basically is broken down into the smallest building block to build the application or that aspect of the application that still makes logical sense and gives enough context to any of these disciplines looking at it uh, that can still be reduced to smaller components but when doing so it starts to lose the context and the logic uh, to understand what's happening in there. So I will give some examples of how this applies to different disciplines as we go. But this is something that I, I, I truly want to open, open this um, kind of as a window into the ecosystem OS and the key aspect of how we think about uh, and what you will uh, over time learn in this presentation and also in our future communication um, um, about um, this aspect. So on the topics, we, we first going to cover some of the, the key aspect of what is a tech stack. We go through the terminology. Uh, we look at a little bit of the digital economy, API economy as a whole. We look at um, where we are today through a lens of evolution of IT so far. Um, we'll focus closely on the data modeling aspect and, and APIs. Uh, combined. Uh, then we'll look at developing UIs and uh, UI component examples, component-driven development principles. And from there forward, we focus more on the, the kind of the holistic solutions like ecosystem data hubs, ecosystem user accounts, uh, summarizing the ecosystem OS stack, look a little bit of our services and roadmap ahead, and then uh, finalize with uh, some of the core principles, in addition to the, the main one that we covered uh, already in, in what are the, the, the key principles. So we'll welcome to, to the journey of uh, learning about the ecosystem OS tech stack and what that can provide you to help uh, build, oper build, operate or orchestrate uh, digital ecosystems within your local regional ecosystems or business vertical ecosystems globally and while also connecting within and between those ecosystems. So let's start with uh, tech stack. What does that actually refer to? What does it mean? So tech stack is a set of technologies an organization uses to build a web or mobile application or any other digital solution for that matter. 
It's a combination of programming languages, frameworks, libraries, patterns, server, servers, UI, UX solutions, software tools, and so forth used by its developers. So while this is uh, very much uh, from the perspective of the developers, of course, the business owner, business logic holder need to be able to, for example, make decisions or understand about the tech stack that they are going to choose because that sets the foundation for all of the future developments going forward. So when we look at more closely, why does this uh, choosing and understanding the tech stack matter for business owners? So not only the development side, the developers who typically are the ones either making these decisions or choosing the tech stacks um, for, for whatever is going to be built. So a tech stack is, is the underlying elements of everything, frameworks, languages, software, and so forth, that everything else is built on. So you can imagine the analogy of a you know, skyscraper, a tall building. You have to be very sure where you're going to build that tall building and what's underneath that. What is the foundation that you're going to use to build everything else? Because once you are further along, it will be very difficult, if not almost impossible, to start uh, thinking of transitioning uh, to other tech stacks. So that will set the future for a long time ahead. It will also define many things about how things will work, what can and cannot be done, or how things can be done, or how things cannot be done long into the future. So really picking the right combination of underlying development tools is very important in the early days of the project. So this typically is, is, uh, gets oftentimes uh, not properly considered because usually the starting point is that we just want to build a proof of concept. We just want to get something out quickly. We just need to build something uh, so that we can validate whether this makes sense. But usually, so the underlying you know, considerations for tech stack are not considered that important. But what usually ends up happening in case if that validation doesn't happen, uh, it, it may lead to situation that, well, it didn't matter at, at, at all, or it could be a situation where whatever tech stack was used, that it uh, appears uh, too costly, either uh, to operate or financially, that then the other aspect of the tech stack, um, basically the cost factors and so forth, or how it can be developed further, actually um, gets the, the, the proof of concept to state that it was validated, that it cannot work. Where in fact, if there would have been a different tech stack, it could have worked. It could have been done differently, cheaper, faster, with lower maintenance and so forth, that would reduce the cost and therefore make it financially sustainable at lower whatever revenue or business model considerations. Another aspect is that if the validation with uh, whatever random tech stack is chosen, uh, that it works actually. Typically this leads into a uh, into situation where now uh, the business side of things typically wants to push this forward and just continue with whatever prototype was out there to accelerate and try to grab as much market share as possible and just start building on top of whatever was there. Again, uh, making the choice for proper uh, evaluation of the tech stack for longer term commitment as a something that gets overlooked and or forgotten. And that speaks the further it goes, it may be so that only let's only do these couple of things and then we'll revisit. And whenever a developer side tries to say that, hey, we should really reconsider this, we should do the whole thing over, we should start over, we should build this properly. And there's a conflict between time availability, urgency to the market, um, available budgets and so forth. So usually it's very hard to get the justification later on to redo things, to spend the same budgets that already were spent um, and whether it's less or more, and most importantly, to allow same time to be spent again. So these are some of the typical things that happen uh, in this context. When we look at the benefit side, um, 
in general, uh, the more common stack between others working with same same problem space, it helps to accelerate overall development for everyone to develop and use more common assets, whether it's software components, data models, user interface, best practices, user stories, and so on, so forth. And specifically, this is relevant when we are talking about digital ecosystems, because in digital ecosystems, it's all about others working with same problem space together, independently, without any central controlling uh, party, but more uh, central orchestrators and central coordinators, a more neutral perspective without the mandate to dictate how others should work and use. So it's a more volunteer approach, others working on the same problem space where uh, sharing common assets become more aligned with open source projects and open source software type of practices. It also helps to establish better support models by vendors and also between the peers. They are better and they are healthier, uh, meaning that it's easier to choose and change vendors when having more vendors or more providers or more employees, talent, whatnot, that are familiar with the same stack used in the same problem space. Over time, what it does, it helps to establish its own growing ecosystem of actors familiar with the stack and related industries. So why ecosystem OS stack specifically? In general, it helps to establish specifically for ecosystem developers and operators needs. So everything that is included in ecosystem OS stack is designed and selected and validated and vetted from the perspective of future proofing the technology, looking at the unique uh, tr digital transformation within the ecosystems, not only for organizations or individual uh, smaller companies, but nevertheless, these technologies very well apply also to anyone who are starting to build uh, anything uh, for future oriented uh, technology solutions that have ecosystem like uh, uh, needs like ability for other applications to connect with um, other applications. It helps, helps to establish that common open stack, collaborated, collaboration between digital ecosystem operators, orchestrators and developers. And specifically, we are here talking about uh, locally focused ecosystems like city level ecosystems for innovation, entrepreneurship, for example, um, or for anything, uh, any ecosystem that has this multi-stakeholder collaboration needs. Equally, it helps same in the focus for business vertical ecosystems that spread across multiple um, regional and local ecosystems like um, medical uh, or med tech or fintech or any of um, travel tech uh, ecosystems that cross uh, uh, that go across multiple local ecosystems and typically the operator or the orchestrator in that business vertical is some um, multinational uh, organization or company who wants to facilitate not only um, value chain type of ecosystem but more of a platform eco platform economy ecosystem direct collaboration between different uh, customers or consumers and producers alike. So basically it also helps to bring ecosystem development expertise and business logic deeply embedded into the stack itself. So it's not just a tech stack for the sake of tech stack. It's not only technology for the sake of technology. Our role here is to put uh, all of our years of experience inside startup ecosystem development, innovation ecosystem development in, in uh, 30 different uh, local country, cities around the world, as well as our ex experiences building uh, vertical ecosystems and platform business models on the private side and 
having validated these technologies in real use in practice. And of course, we use them ourselves. Uh, TechStack also uh, brings aspect to the security. It removes multiple moving parts and systems from the hosting infrastructure, resulting in fewer servers and systems to harden uh, against attack. Basically, it de decouples the monotonic application into smaller independently running pieces where um, single point there where there is no single point of failure, but uh, its in, its components, its individual functions in serverless side and so forth. So basically, it's more distributed model and therefore uh, more secure. And different developers, different actors can work on different individual uh, parts of the overall solution uh, without needing to give access to other parts and therefore controlling better who have even access to break uh, what parts of the system when they are working on those. So basically everything is, uh, is modularized in different levels. It, because of the dynamic tools and services uh, can be provided by vendors with teams dedicated to securing their specific systems and providing high levels of service. So basically um, in this stack, there's multiple options for each part of the of the service that can be provided that where there's multiple providers that can provide that service so not only does it help to to uh, get better uh, let's say offers uh, or requests for proposal for services but also if not being happy with some service it, it is easier to switch any individual components provider without losing the benefits of the overall stack. For scale and performance, um, when the sites can be served entirely from a content delivery network, a CDN, there is no complex logic or workflow to, 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 de to determine that what assets can be chased and when. So basically this means that uh, any of the front-end side, the user interface side, can be put uh, close to the end user. So if, if the, it doesn't matter where the service is designed and run, it can be deployed to run in a, a content delivery network that has a place uh, distributed globally close to the user. So that also the, the delivery time. So when user uh, uses the service, the latency to get access to that service is as quick as possible. With all the pages already available in CDN, close to the user, ready to serve, it, it means low latency and high performance. Um, one of the most important things and oftentimes the afterthought as well is the, maintain, the maintenance of the system. So the maintainability aspect uh, is very important. So the whole architecture is designed from that perspective that um, it helps to reduce the hosting complexity and maintenance tasks overall. It can be hosted without uh, physical or virtual servers, which might require patching, updating and maintaining, and usually always do. And we'll look at the architecture in more detail later on. It does not need a team of experts to keep services running uh, for the most parts, because the, those typical things that usually require a, a, a hosting of a virtual server and then maintenance of that virtual server is that those components can be actually got as an infrastructure as a service or software as a service type of solutions. And finally, portability. <clears throat> So portability means that there is no vendor or infrastructure login. So all of the pieces uh, that define uh, the essence of the tech stack use are all based on open source uh, languages or principles or concepts uh, in such way that the same thing can be taken out from one system and put to another system with uh, minimum uh, effort without breaking how the system works or how the data flows or how the data models uh, function. 
So they can be host from wide variety of hosting services and have greater ability to move them to your preferred host. So that also means that initially you can start with, um, with more prototyping, uh, proof of concept level and move to a more robust uh, setups that uh, require higher budgets um, to, to simply uh, choose more of the different aspects in play that uh, the initial setup needs without needing to change the tech stack itself. And then from the developer experience point of view, uh, there is no dependency on the proprietary technologies or exotic and little known frameworks. So everything is very much globally um, available. A lot of knowledge is available about all the different aspects and details of any of these technologies. Uh, tons of YouTube videos, you know, stack overflows, different Slack channels and so forth. Uh, so any you know problems typically have a simple Google to find an answer where someone has already asked that question and find a solution, as well as finding uh, dedicated um, freelancer expertise, software companies, and so forth um, to to help to resolve any of the issues. So it's really built on widely available tools and conventions. So let's look at some of the key terminology um, related to te technology in general. So we always want to do this uh, kind of as, an, as a key entryway to make sure that we understand the things properly, um, what we are talking about. Not only from one perspective, but taking into account the perspective of a designer, business owner, uh, and technology uh, developers as well. So when we look at the term information technology, aka IT, what it really means and has always mean that it is the use of computers to store, retrieve, transmit and manipulate data or information. So it is key to understand that IT has always been about data. But when people talk about IT, it gets much broader than that. And people have different views. They think of it as a software, they think of it as, you know, hardware and so forth. But the IT is all about the data. When we look at the software, then the software, of course, is a collection of information and data that tell the computer how to work. Basically that tells the hardware how to work with data. And then IT systems is then the, the hardware side or digitalized virtualized hardware side of things. So it is the actual information system, a communication system, a computer system, including all hardware, software, and peripheral equipment, basically to um, work with data. And then looking at data model, the data model is an abstract model that organizes elements of data and standardizes how they relate to one another and to the properties of real world entities. So here, a couple of key things is that data model is not same as database model. Data model is not same as data itself. Data is more like a template or a canvas uh, a template model for how and what data is stored and how it relates, uh, how different uh, parts of data, aka objects, uh, relate to each other. And another key point here is uh, that they take their shape or the best way to design a grid data model is to take as much from the real world entities uh, examples as possible instead of uh, reimagining data models in any different way than the way they exist in the real world. <clears throat> so this is uh, specifically important to understand where the business logic and the way non-technical uh, uh, product owners think about the world is very much how we see the real world. And therefore we should get that same model into data model 
and not design it from any other perspective. Other related terminology uh, important to cover. Um, we'll look at uh, the UX UI design. So this is very much the kind of, uh, let's say, most commonly known the interaction point when building and designing software or applications and that uh, business owners look at together with designers. It's basically the, the discipline, the design process that design teams use to create applications and services, aka products that provide the minimal, meaningful and relevant experiences to the end users, those users of the applications and through the user interface. So this involves the design of the entire user process of, of accessing, onboarding, and using an application or service, including related aspects like branding, uh, written communication, design, usability, and actual function of the application. So it, it includes also things like uh, support functions. So supporting users when they have problems with application features or they don't understand and so forth in the form of uh, support content communication. So it's basically designing all the different aspects that the user from the user interface point of view will encounter in trying to search for solution, finding a solution, uh, onboarding to a solution, using that and so forth. While the user experience design is often used in intensively with terms such as user interface design and usability. Those are important aspects of UX designs, but they are also subsets of it. So the broader UX design covers more. And here uh, I want to bring uh, an example in the context of UX design, and user interface design, I want to bring this terminology for minimum logical elements. So what to focus on when talking about product design and so forth. So the key MLE in UX UI design is the user story. So when you break down the entire application uh, or the service into different pieces, you start from what the application should be doing, who are the users and so forth breaking that down into individual features. And then each of those features are further broken down into user stories. And while user stories are further broken down into individual uh, task flow steps that user takes, they start from certain place screen and they go through another step and another step, ultimately getting to the end goal. Um, that's more of a designer's discipline, that collective level uh, with business owner, uh, business logic owner, designer and developer. The collective level is the user story. A user story basically has a specific format, how it's written. It has three parts into it. First part, it's one sentence with first part saying what type of user is in question. The second part defines what the user uh, goal is, what they are trying to achieve. And then the third part of the sentence is why they want to achieve that, to achieve what. So as a simple example of a user story is, as a non-registered user, I want to create an account so that I can use the service. And that sentence basically is the driving guideline and identity for all the things that will happen to make that user story into reality. It defines what type of user is in question, what they want to do, and the reason why. And now from that context, different actors, designers can design how that flow will go. Developers can think of what types of things need to be considered in the back end side. Uh, business logic owner can think of what type of data needs to be captured throughout that registration process. Looking at the data modeling as the next key topic, the data modeling is a design of a data model for information system, a model for what data and how it's stored and used. 
data model is also known as SEMA, and it normally consists of entity types, attributes, relationships, integrity rules, and definitions of those objects. So for example, in representing a car, be composed of a number of other elements, which in turn represents the color and size of the car and defines its owner. So the car can have a hood, wheels as separate things, and you can break down wheels further into the, the tires and the wheels themselves, and nuts and bolts how to connect those. So data modeling is really the area where the business logic gets into the system, defining what information we actually store and use into the system overall. In, in data modeling terminology, um, bound context is the MLE in data modeling. So the bound context terminology actually comes from domain-driven uh, design. And uh, it defines tangible boundaries of applicability of some subdomain. A domain is something like events or mentoring or, um, or uh, inventory management or accounting. <clears throat> It is an area where a certain subdomain makes sense while the others don't. So it can be a talk, a presentation, a code project with physical boundaries defined by the artifact. So it's something that is an object that has connections to necessary other objects. For example, in the case that car example, um, a, an engine would be a bounded context. So while the engine is pretty big component of a car, it can be further broken down to different things, but looking at some of the engine parts alone don't really add uh, value without having the context where that belongs to. Then we'll look at through uh, API, so application programming interface. Uh, this is basically uh, when we as humans end user use the user interface. We move with mouse or with the thumbs in the mobile device, click buttons to get the computer to do things for us. The application programming interface is the interface how other softwares can use the software provided or the application provided. So basically developers build these API connections both to expose their own application to other computers to use directly or use those APIs from another computer to access additional software features or data that they hold. So with API, you can enhance if you have your own application or service or data hub where you are, for example, uh, managing photos. You could use an API of services from Google or Amazon to basically send that photo through the API, have that make photo recognition for types of things that exist in that, like separating, does it have car pictures or not? Is it summer or winter? And get that information back along with the photo. So now you have a photo where a com computer uh, features from another software have been used through an API to enhance the data information that you have about the photos instead of just having the photos. Now you know what those photos actually have without having people to look at those photos and enter tags for what they include. Equally, uh, data can be, of course, shared. You can read data from another application. You can write data to another application uh, from another application. And then when we look at the front end, front end development, it's the practice of converting information, AKA data to an application user interface so that users can view and interact with that data and enter new data if needed. So the, the front end basically means the 
the user interface and the, uh, that the designers have designed and then front-end software developers have built uh, for enabling end users to interact with data, to view data, to view information uh, generated from data, uh, enter new data or modify existing data. And an MLE in front-end development is element component. So these element components that are also known as molecules by this atomic design system that has very well documented uh, basically basic principles around the front-end development and design alike are groups of smaller components also known as atoms or building blocks that are basically bonded together and are the smallest fundamental units of a compound. So again, similar to user story or, um, or in context of um, bounded context in data modeling, uh, when you broke them further into small pieces, they basically lose the business logic of what those components are meant to display or do for the user. So again, the, the MLE refers to the most logical level that it makes sense for business logic owner, um, designer and developer to look at together that provide enough context of what we are actually looking at and what, what type of decisions we should make. It can be break into further pieces and actually are, but that goes then more into the developer's side alone to work in, in those levels and it's less relevant from business logic owner's perspective. And then uh, looking at the back end, uh, so back end refers to any part of the website or software program that users don't see. So basically more broadly, the back end uh, includes also the data modeling part because that's typically not seen, the model itself, user interact with data itself. In programming terminology, the back end is the data access layer. So when a developer looks at the backend, they still also make a, a bigger separation by uh, looking at the software to access the data between the user interface and the database as the backend software. And then there's the whole uh, database or data storage um, behind that as well. In the backend, uh, in, in the backend, um, side, the backend use case is the MLE in, in the backend side. So use case is a specific situation for what a set of backend workflows in an application could, could potentially be used. And these typically mirror uh, what is defined in the user UX uh, user story. So typically when there's a user story indicating uh, what should happen, how users should be able to navigate using the user interface uh, to what they want to get to and why, then the backend use case basically breaks that down into backend workflows, smaller pieces, but again, because it's connected to the user story uh, by looking at uh, individual backend workflows alone is not a complete enough picture to understand and work together with um, uh, business logic owners, designers, and software developers. And as one more thing, uh, I added here uh, a term for robot process automation, a, uh, RPA. And specifically, uh, this is specifically useful and important technology for when making transitions from uh, legacy softwares or existing monotonic applications or uh, other tech stacks and architectures without needing to build um, a separate application or uh, API interfaces. Basically how the, the RPA works that it can work from the user interface created for humans by creating these software robots that can interact like a user on top of the interface to do the same actions as the user would do using their mouse and clicking the buttons and typing information or whatever that may be. And then uh, either enter data into systems or extract data from the systems 
uh, and database and basically that way creating uh, a computer uh, interface into an old school application. So basically all the applications have human interface. So therefore, if a human can use it, a software robot can use it. So that is, of course, something that is meant to be a, a transitional solution, or in some cases where those legacy systems are so deeply embedded that nobody even wants to touch what's inside of them. Uh, if they keep running uh, and working, then oftentimes they rather leave them in the background running and then the interface is created by robot process automation using them. So moving forward to, to talk more about the digital economy as a whole. And again, the key here is really to connect the, the, the business logic owners, the budget holders perspective more with what's happening in the, in the digital economy and the world and technology side. And help bridge that communication gap between talking about these different aspects. So as a starting point, we need to look at what is the common user perception for those that are not developers. So basically all of, all of us who are non, not developers that are business owners, designers and so forth, uh, the generic starting point is to look things and understand things from the user interface pers perspective, as well as how we have interacted with software before. So that also means that for the most non-developers, non-technical people, the digital economy means the same as what they perceive, what they see when they interact and use softwares, when they, inter when they do Google searches, when they you know, uh, use Facebook, when they buy stuff from Amazon, use uh, a project management system, accounting system, email, and so forth. It's the perception they get from the user interface. But of course, the real economy is similar as if you go to, you know, uh, in the store. Uh, it's the products that you buy as a consumer, but behind that is a whole, you know, uh, logistic systems, a whole uh, value system, uh, a value chain of creating those products all the way from raw materials, packaging, branding, designing, delivery, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, the due dates of the products and, and so forth. So in the digital economy, it's very much the same. There's much more than happens behind the user interface. So the real di digital economy is everything else, almost everything else, except what we as end users experience from the interface. <clears throat> so it's the API economy, it's the data economy, it's the digital ecosystems. And the typical users in that environment are developers, use, developer users, other companies, so B2B uh, in the digital world, uh, companies interacting directly through their applications with other, other companies, uh, other applications as users, whether those applications are other B2B companies or whether they are consumer uh, faced solutions. But this is really to understand that a digital economy is both the top and the bottom combined, but even more so everything that happens behind the user interface. <clears throat> so when we look at this from the, the kind of the very simplified lens uh, in the digital economy and specifically uh, platform economy, when we think of Amazon's, Google's, Facebook, Uber's and so forth, Typically, there's uh, these multi-sided multi or two-sided markets uh, running on top of platforms where on one hand you have those who provide something and those who consume something. Uh, and typically in the digital world that is in form of data or it is representing the real, for, real for, uh, assets like in Uber uh, converted into a digital business model. So running real world assets through a digital interface. So in simple terms, in Wikipedia, those who write the articles and those who read the articles. In Facebook, those who create the content, those who read it, who like it. And then if they become a comment and they comment on a, on a chain, they become a provider 
of data as well. But in the case of Facebook and Google, of course, the even bigger part of that is the advertisers on the other side, where the whole target is to get both end users and end user providers to interact on top of the platform only to connect the B2B digital economy to provide advertising and access to these users as the business model. So from that, it's easy to understand the platforms themselves, the platform business models that operate these types of marketplaces to connecting different actors directly on their platform. And from that angle, it's also uh, easier to understand the surrounding ecosystems that exist around those platforms. Like iOS is a platform that has an iOS developer ecosystem and so forth. But what gets harder is when you start thinking of the digital ecosystems without having a platform. So when you think about someone orchestrating and making things work in the background, making the pipes work, making the infrastructure work on the background for those who run smaller or bigger platforms on top of that, or even simple um, service applications on top of that. So then we are really talking about the digital ecos ecosystems in the digital economy where there is a need for these types of actors that look after the connectivity aspect within and between platforms, within and between other ecosystems, and not really focusing on the end user provider layer directly. They can, and some of them do, but the, the, the majority of the effort should be to focus on making the ecosystem work and not trying to be a controlling actor uh, in the ecosystem to, to uh, force space from, from uh, others. And this is becoming harder and harder for, um, because the world is learning and it's uh, adapting. So, so um, very much um, the direction is to try to avoid creating any more giant platforms, uh, uh, monopoly platforms that control big parts of what happens in the world. This happens from regulatory perspective. This happens from the user's perspective. This happens in the B2B level, trying to uh, rethink these models in such a way where it focuses more on this ecosystem type of activity instead of uh, controlling platforms. But those still, of course, are possible to emerge and some will be successful in creating those as well. So further along, we look at the API economy a bit more through a case example. So I want to intentionally take this example away from you know, software and application first. So looking this from a very end user hardware real world type of example. So let's imagine this type of a scenario where we have two different vending machines in a high traffic area, let's say in a railway station uh, that has high traffic for all kinds of different users. And we have very uh, kind of generic products that pretty much, you know, majority of the world consumes in one way or the other, at least periodically. So when we look at in this use case, we can see that we have the assets inside the devices or in these machines. We have the user interface that user can interact, they can pay, they can order what's available in, in these uh, machines or applications in, in this case. So now we can look at this from that perspective that if I'm a user and I want to get both. So I have to go through two different transactions. So I need to go uh, if I want to get Pringles and Coke, I need to do two different transactions using two different machines. And in worst case, they could have two different interfaces for me to learn that the other one has very different uh, interface that I need to learn how this works and then need to learn how this works as well. It could be that the other accepts credit cards and the other does only use coins or the other accepts mobile payments. So there's all kinds of considerations for what's available through these devices. Now, it doesn't really matter too much if I only want to get a Coke or if I only want to get Pringles. But if I want to get both, 
how this could be made through uh, APIs to work better would be that this other machine would talk to the other machine and I could make both orders from one user interface with one transaction. So I could just simply get the Coke and the Pringles paid from one system and the products would drop out in both of these at the same time. Now th this gets ex as specifically interesting if you think that there's now a line, a queue to these machines. So now let's say if there's a queue for that and the other product is a hot day, so people want more of the drink, um, and, or it's a lunchtime and people want more of the something to eat. <clears throat> now, again, the other machine may sit idle uh, with less use, but if the in both of these machines interface could cater products from both sides, now both machines can be used to order uh, one of the other. So you could use the Coke machine to, to just get Pringles. You could use Pringles machine just to get Coke. So this is re very much what uh, these APIs make possible. But what's more important, what's also important in context of APIs that of course there needs to be business terms negotiated as well. It's not simply a technical exercise. There needs to be saying that, okay, to make this work, I want to get 10% commission and I want to get 10% commission in return the other way around. And that way it requires also a, a standard agreement to put in place, or at least initially a negotiate an agreement to put in place for this to function. So we have the soda machine, we have the chips machine. And if we add 13 to that mix, now we can also see that while there's only two, when we only have two, we basically only need one two direction connection between the, the, the machines. If we add a third one, now we need two connections for every single machine. So no longer one connection is enough because you have three machines. And when you go further with this, the more you add applications and more you add these connections, um, the more connect applications you want to connect to, the number of connections multiplies. And this creates a problem and an opportunity for ecosystem uh, operator or orchestrator actor. So basically by it being able to, with even in case of trying to connect three different applications or services together, uh, it become, it, it uh, it becomes more than one connection. So whenever there's need to connect um, more than uh, more than two to communicate with each other, it makes sense to consider a hub approach, whether that's uh, from the beginning or whether that's expected to happen later. So in this case example, now we have added soda, chips, candy, coffee, ice cream, pizza, and SIM cards vending machines, and they could all be communicating with, with each other with the ecosystem data hub approach. And at the same time, that means that it's more logical that there's a different dedicated act actor only look at the connections, the data models, the APIs, and standardized agreements that are applied to everyone who wants to connect to this hub and network to interact with other machines instead of being a coffee, uh, coffee machine vending machine provider or candy vending machine provider as their primary expertise. Their primary expertise becomes making the ecosystem work, making the connections work, making the data models work, and making the standard agreements that makes it easy for anyone to plug in or plug off from uh, the system. And of course, this is the same thing as, you know, from the day of fax machines or whatnot, the more there is those who connect the network, the more valuable it becomes to all members of the network. So when we look at this in the context of uh, applications in general, uh, it is very much the same thing. Now we just need to think of things like CRMs, event systems, uh, platforms, project tools, social networks, and so forth. Again, there's users who use the user interface and the old school approach is that there's a box of software, a monotonic application 
uh, with, uh, with some spaghetti code inside there. And the typical way of how the, the non-digital economy uh, interaction between application happens is through people. And we know how people are the broken phone in the system. You don't need to put too many people in the line and ask the first to tell a story and hear the last in the line how much the story has changed. And you can't have that type of you know, broken phone in the business communication. But nevertheless, it exists for the majority of business still, regardless of how 2021 and you know, digital we all think the world is. Majority of the world is still passing information through this anal anal analogy. Analog means where then you can also see the huge difference for those with those companies who don't. Like Amazon, who introduced uh, the concept uh, in 2002. Not externally, but internally to everything to work through APIs. So in the software side, it is basically the, the way to make sure that the broken phone doesn't happen so that people don't print out PDFs and send those through email and add you know, additional communication on top of that, explaining what the PDF actually holds information. So the information should go as it is from system to system. And with the right tools, that's way more effective. It's cheaper, uh, has less errors because the data is what it is in the other system. These also have the same problem. So connecting any number of applications in the ecosystem, whether those event systems to, to investor networks, to university, to you know, uh, R&D labs on a private side, to um, customer marketplace for application solutions in Salesforce or whatnot. The same problem without ecosystem orchestration <clears throat> happens here. So again, a data hub is the solution to allow an unlimited number of connections to exist through a single uh, interface, a single API interface per each application and getting the same benefits that the more the, the, the more the number of connected applications increases, the value of the network increases to all participants that are part of the network. Because every time when they already have a connection, <clears throat> they will be able to get new value into their own application and service every time when someone else joins the network. So looking from the ecosystem example, <clears throat> We have uh, an, a model here uh, using events as something that is very common in both geographically focused local regional ecosystems as well as vertical ecosystems. Everywhere there's a lot of events happening to basically uh, share knowledge and pass information in a, in a more broader format. So in the traditional events portal uh, approach, the event organizers are expected to manually come and enter the event information into the portal. It's like a big silo. And then event participants are expected to come and find the events information from that portal. <clears throat> when we look at this setup more uh, as an ecosystem approach, now we should allow all of the organizers to use whatever their preferred application is. Most likely it's something closely associated with their own website where they want to push that event uh, out. And from there, that data should get into the events portal website. And most importantly, the data hub. Where that further also on the end user side, they should be able to use their preferred participant application where they can simply see the data about available events wherever they navigate without needing to go into this silo in the internet to find if something relevant is there. So this could be, for example, a personal calendar. They should be able to simply subscribe with certain filters to interesting events and have it available in their calendar in the mix of their own you know, life events and ha happenings that they have in their calendar. They could see, oh, I have an interesting event happening there so I want to make myself available there. 
I want to register for that. Or it could be any other application that they heavily use um, as their primary application. But it should not require that all of us have to go to specific place to, or even know that those places exist. Or remember to go and check if anything interesting has appeared. So for events distribution, to show events inside other applications and websites. So not only to, to basically use as an end user, but also in the other ecosystems, other actors could promote others, others events in their own event pages in their own website. Those can be further embedded into tools like e-learning platforms. So when someone is consuming evergreen e-learning content <clears throat> to learn about certain topics, then there could be uh, a logical place to show what type of live events related to these topics are happening, uh, pulling that data from the hubs. Of course, in calendars like Covered and other ecosystem organizations website. And more importantly, it should be able to expand globally, specifically now when everyone's you know, living the, the post-COVID time, majority of events have turned virtual. So now you have events happening all around the world that has no physical uh, limitations to take part. Most of them, those are open to the world for anyone to sign up to learn about and, and uh, get expertise from different areas. So even more so than ever, there is value in distributing events information also within and between the ecosystems. <clears throat> so let's look at the, the evolution of IT. So where we have come from and where we are today. So this is important to kind of understand, uh, to add in the context of how we understand software. This is basically when you know computers came to, to as, a, as a personal computer available to everyone. This is how we have started to understand software. It's a box of software that we buy from a store. We install it locally into the system and it's self-containing with including everything, the software itself and the data running in our own operating system. <clears throat> So when we look at that and we start from the key terminology, IT is really for data. So let's look at this, uh, how this has then, this box of software is composed of. Typically there is something like an SQL database to, to capture the data. And the data model is basically to describe what data we have and then putting it in a database. And then we have that access layer, the backend software, the software that accesses that, that data and then shows that to user interface where users can interact with that or enter new data or modify data. And then through that user interface, the software takes those commands and makes those things change in the database. And then this whole thing has been packaged in the box of software as one monotonic thing. And then that has been basically running a local uh, PC computer as a local software. And this is why the reason why we get data mixed with the software, mixed with the user interface as one black box, because it has been packaged that way. <clears throat> but when we look at the ecosystem operations, ecosystem orchestration, data hubs, and making data flow, we need to start unbundling this. <clears throat> So even when all of that software have moved software as a service, it actually initially had moved to the to the online space in, in pretty much same format. That instead of having a PC, you have a server uh, that runs a operating system. That then that operating system runs um, software that is able, able to manage the SQL database uh, and then uh, data access layer like PHP software uh, connecting with the user interface. So all of this has still been in one package uh, running uh, related software inside an operating system, then inside a virtual server online. But this is basically the past. This is the thing that 
is going to is is being for several years already moving into past and then this bundle has been started to unlock so in between there has been uh, phases like the database because it's inside there the the data model and the structure has become very loose and actually the quality of data has started to suffer when it has been inside the box then it been basically that we can control the database with software so not not too much need to consider the data how it lives outside of this box because it's only used through an interface and basically then when we generalize this into the common terms we have the user interface backend software database server software and so forth but how this has started to unbundle is that this physical server that basically they still exist but uh, servers have been then been software uh, virtualized by software on top of that so then those became virtual server so now you get a server uh, the whole setup um, from online and you don't need to run your own hardware or the how the hardware is run also in those big server houses it's virtualized so that multiple virtual servers run on top of physical servers so now you've got virtual server as a, as, a, as a service. But it still had this monotonic bundle uh, running on top of that. Even if it's virtualized, all these other things are uh, bundled together as a monotonic software. So even that, you know, not saying that LinkedIn is any more like this, but as users, we still experience the software very much as, you know, one site has one software and I do things there and I, when I want to use another software, I go to another site and they're separate uh, from that. But the key factor that actually started to break this uh, dynamic was the introduction of mobile apps. So because majority of things when they, uh, software, when they moved to the cloud, now you had a laptop that you were using the software, um, but then it, it wasn't the same that when you wanted to run those locally in your mobile phone. So now how do you interact with the same software, same application from two different uh, places or two different devices? Of course, you could use the browser in the mobile to access the, you know, those services as similarly as you access them in a desktop browser. But what if you are online? specifically when the, the connections are not always stable, specifically when we look at this 10 years ago. Now you need local apps that only synchronize the data uh, and then run all of the software uh, as native applications in the device. So to make that happen so that the data itself is the same, uh, these types of API started to emerge as de facto thing that anyone who wanted to create mobile apps had to create also APIs. Now, this just added more to the complexity of the black box. And therefore, what happened next is that something had to be removed. And what got removed next was the virtual servers. So now you can get the backend as a service that includes server as a service and the, the backend where you, you only need to run APIs, the, the, the data base itself, um, and any specific backend software functions that are custom to your own application. Now this simplified both how quickly things can be developed, how simple these architectures can run, and also uh, how many different user interfaces can be catered for. In addition, just by making the APIs available through own use for mobile applications and desktop uh, application or browser interfaces, as a side product now, more and more things have APIs uh, considered as not as a, end, as a side thought or afterthought, but as something that is actually makes most sense to get started with. So the picture has changed that the, there's less things to worry about on the back end side. Things are available uh, uh, as, as a service. And the focus is really getting back to where the whole IT term has emerged from is information management. So when we move forward from here, 
a big transition has happened most recently, only in the couple of, I think, 2016, when, when GraphQL came out uh, as an open source. It has been developed since 2012, but 2016, it started to really, it became uh, as an open source. And then ultimately it was adopted by the Linux Foundation as one of the, the biggest global actor to host all kinds of open source assets as a neutral actor in such a way where no one can control that. And that really unlocks the creativity and the use of any solution because now everyone can be uh, feel comfortable and free that nobody can control that. Nobody can take me take that away from us so we can build on top of that concept. So GraphQL APIs made uh, the possibility of managing APIs even more effective than REST APIs. In some cases, REST APIs still make sense, but, but uh, for the most part, GraphQL outbeats and makes things way more simple, specifically for, for accessing, documenting, creating APIs from the data model and doing the technical data model documentation itself. So, when we look at the, the core of ecosystem OS, so the very core uh, of, of ecosystem OS is really developing your business and operating logic into the data model itself. This is, this is the core for ecosystem orchestration, ecosystem data hub, uh, making the data flow. It all starts from the data model. So it's important that the data model schema and, and APIs and so forth are created using uh, open uh, source, open standard language that no one can control. And that also that language is independent of any technology. It doesn't connect to you know, Windows or iOS or anything of that. It's a self-contained language to, do, to document the data models as well as um, create APIs and API documentation based on that. So at the, at the core of designing it, it's all about GraphQL schema. <clears throat> at, the, at the core of operating the service, it's all about GraphQL APIs. And if there are needs for converting GraphQL APIs to REST APIs, then they are just automatic services for that as well as well as the other way around, converting REST APIs to GraphQL for those who are suffering with you know, uh, legacy starting points or existing systems. So you can start from any legacy system using RP, uh, RPA. If you are a bit advanced, you can use these uh, automatic converters. The key is to know what you want to get to and why. And this is what we want to communicate with ecosystem OS tech stack. And then at the core of using the services is, of course, the user interfaces. Interfaces, uh, we need to look at also what is the most modern uh, ways of building user interfaces, specifically in this type of architecture approach. When it's not on, as, as integrated, you know, mixed, interconnected inside a monotonic application, but something that actually lives as an independent thing, connecting to data through uh, APIs. So it's really about these three things as the main focus areas. User interface, interacting with data, and there the disciplines of UA, UX, UI design, and in there the MLE of focusing on user stories. On ecosystem data model, it's all about creating the common language. Uh, the MLE there is the bound context and really looking at uh, how to design a data model in our ecosystem and what support and services are available for that. And then finally, APIs and data hubs is for data sharing. And here it's all about uh, GraphQL APIs that and, and documenting those that are auto-generated from 
the actual design process of designing the data models. And most importantly, then the business logic on top of that, it, what is the commercial terms to use those APIs? What data is made available for free? How much it can be consumed for free? Is there a certain price point to consume certain type of data? Or is this a certain price point consuming certain uh, data at certain level? Or then if it's using software features from another application, what is the subscription model for using those features or per use type of model? And who can join, with what terms can they join and, and so forth. So one of the things that um, we struggled several times uh, over the years when we have been putting this together um, and coming to trying to simplify this um, where the technology today is, what's possible with what tools available. It really comes to that internal fight uh, specifically for those who come from a business logic side and have been sold many years how complex the technology is and how vague and mysterious those black boxes are is the, the, the struggle to fight. Can it be so simple? Like can this whole complex thing, when it's specifically looking at ecosystem level, when we look at and you know, clean all the unnecessary, unnecessary you know, jargon away from it and all the language away from it that is not necessary, when we clean all the past things, how technology used to be, how complex or costly things were, has it really achieved this point of simplicity? It's still complex, so it's not like you know, buying ice cream on a, on a sunny day. It still involves many things, but it's got to 10% or less of the complexity that it used to have only a couple of years ago. And we all know that technology tries fast. The power that you have in your mobile phone today is more power than all of the technology that they had available to ship the man in the moon. So that curve is real. And we um, oftentimes are not shown the real development looking from the user interface perspective as business users. So it's really time to understand the capabilities and that's the big uh, focus what we are looking to accomplish with ecosystem always open stack. So looking at this, the focus being your business operating logic going into data model and then the data that that model captures, manages, and make available. And then the user interfaces, how uh, end users interact with that business logic. And the reason data, uh, the APIs are not here because they actually are in, in, the, in the GraphQL uh, data modeling aspect, they are automatically generated. There is no afterthought of thinking of how do we create APIs from this. And then when we look at the, the, the broader benefits of the stack, uh, on the front end side, we have open source UI components, which I'll show some examples. When we look at uh, the, the, the core of everything, where the budget li budgets live, where the business logic live, where the decisions are made, there's ecosystem always tech stack to have everyone independently benefit from the stack using common assets, not needing to reinvent the wheel collectively growing the ecosystem of those who understand and operate with same tools. And then on the data modeling side, there's an open standard data model that we uh, maintain and build for, for the ecosystem stack and publish new versions uh, for what data can cover from that. And that's just a copy paste and plug and play to use locally. We are looking to host that. We take input for that data model development. We don't control that. Anyone can take it, use it, modify, fork their own, establish an, a separate open standard data model if there would be any complexities, problems with that. We are also looking to, over time, uh, get that uh, governanced by multi-stakeholder actors uh, that are already using ecosystem tech stack. So, this all comes together to, to have existing global developer community that is already out there 
but also a growing developer community that specifically uh, can look at the ecosystem OS tech stack as the focus area, because each of the components on the ecosystem OS stack has their own ecosystem and own developer communities already, but they are focused on that stack specific component. We put this specific uh, stack together from those components that already have different communities. And with this, we hope to bring uh, more focus and simplify things uh, for the network of global ecosystem operators and orchestrators uh, running their operations using this open stack. So if we look at more the data model and APIs, it's really the APIs between everything by default. So the key here really is to understand that API development is not a separate function. So it doesn't need to be even thought as such. Documenting APIs and exposing them and thinking of the business terms of those, they may need to be considered. But the technical creation of APIs is an automatic side uh, outcome of um, the data model process. So for, for the interoperability part of that, it requires common data models. So the APIs are just the interface, but then there needs to be a common language established that we facilitate from our side and take on managing a process for developing a open standard data model. So for that, we use uh, uh, data model driven development approach in our own application, whatever we're going to build applications or hubs or models for ourselves or support our customers to do so. We develop the data model first and we publish that outside. We take input uh, for existing data models and we rely on any existing standards out there uh, for different types of uh, industries and so forth, developing this uh, open standard model. So on the GraphQL, it's everything also being GraphQL based. So, and being GraphQL based, it's really possible to do data modeling and API development by non-developers. <clears throat> so this means that getting the business logic directly into um, a data model and therefore APIs can be achieved by those who have already know the business logic. So it doesn't require developer capabilities, expertise to write GraphQL SEMOS. There are tools out there to help design these things from a simple user interface. Sure, there's a, a learning curve for one or two days, but after that, it becomes quite straightforward. So that is the, the, the key thing, how to accelerate that the core essence of business logic can be taken uh, within a couple of days and applied to a level where it can developers can build software on top of that and then using uh, UI components on the front end to put together applications. So APIs are automatically generated and basic API documentation is automatically generated as side product. So here's just for, for really uh, putting this at the cent front and center, that uh, a big part of the success of Amazon is in behind that user interface in all of their digital automation capabilities. And basically this was a, a mandate that they put internally to all of their employees 2002. It's publicly the same message is uh, online verified. And, and basically, um, this, the essence of this is saying that we fix the broken phone syndrome inside our organization and everyone will interact through a user interface in the same system where all of the data is connected through APIs and nobody else can get access to others user interface. And everything should be designed also so that it doesn't matter whether this function is currently in-house and in future outsourced. So basically they modularized their entire organization, all functions to work through APIs internally. 
and everything else they do externally is a side product of that as well. Of course, that's where they started. And you, the whole AWS, Amazon Web Services, everything is basically as an outcome of this. And, and to think about that, that's, that's now almost not yet 20 years ago, but getting close to that. Uh, it has given them a serious head start in how they operate uh, their ecosystems globally. As a used as an example, when they bought, bought the Whole Foods uh, food chain uh, in US a couple of years ago, basically the, the, the sh sh stock price of the competitors went down something like 15% just because Amazon bought it. And actually the price that Amazon bought, 16 billion that they paid for Whole Foods was more, uh, the, the, the price of Whole Foods stock price priced more than what they paid for it. So basically it means that they got it for free. So that was the market reaction when they saw that Amazon comes to a, a new vertical and they already know how to run the digital uh, economy models for that business. So this is something that keeps going and keeps happening more and more and regulators and different countries have a hard time uh, kind of putting the, the toothpaste back to the uh, bottle because um, there's such dependencies on these uh, big actors at the same time, um, but at the same time, um, regulation has find ways to start even in the playing field, specifically starting from consumer data uh, in the form of GDPR and CCPA in California, where uh, the individuals are getting at least rights, legal rights to their own data and can start deciding where they want to host that. So these are all healthy developments, but it, what is more important is that then actors who want to and uh, are looking to build this ecosystem uh, strategies and digital solutions actually get uh, neutral knowledge and stacks that they can use where it's designed, the stack is designed for the purpose of their targets. So for the data model, um, design one of the key things that we have adopted into the stack is uh, domain driven design so this is uh, a language that is specifically uh, created to bridge the business expert jargon aka the business logic owners and technical experts jargon into this ubitios language so of course, it doesn't make sense for us to create or reinvent every, anything. It is to take what are the best existing concepts and models out there that are made openly available um, for the world to utilize and bring them together in a understandable format. Where do they belong to? How are they used? And then those concepts themselves can unlock all the different details that go into that. So we only hear share the very high level of view and also uh, the statement of that we are using it and why we are using it. So domain driven design is a creative collaboration between IT and domain experts, business and operations to iteratively refine and conceptual model that addresses particular domain terminology. So the domain can be accounting, warehouse management, it can be events, management, it can be uh, investor network management. So those are the different uh, domains and there can be any number of domains. The domain model forms a common language given by domain experts for describing system requirements that work equally well for business users and for the software developers. And then where this language goes in is of course uh, the data model itself. So from this, there's a great uh, speech by the creator of this concept and there's books available, but there's also many YouTube uh, videos of different length available for any number of you know, aspects or details to, to look into that. And when we talk about the data model in context uh, using 
the domain driven design. It is in use when applications exchange information data about resource instances and their relationships to, to other resources. The common data model provides consistent definitions of items, best practices for content and guidelines for mapping resource instance data to common data model. So the common data model is the, the, the output of the domain driven design work. And as such, it works as the model for, uh, for everyone building those systems, using those systems. It standardized the characteristics, the concepts of classes, attributes, interfaces, naming rules, naming policies, and the data types that, is, that are in use. So here's a simple visualization of a, of a data model uh, to understand both the domain-driven um, design concept and the data model. So here, this can be um, uh, three different domains. It's one view to look at this, uh, separated by these dotted lines, that the data model is including uh, cross-cutting domains as a whole, but at any given time, the focus can be in one domain. Inside the domain, there can be objects. So there could be the, the, the car that then has different parts into it and so forth. And then there could be the, the gas station that serves the car as a separate domain. So this is pretty much the, the, the the way to mentally and visually consider what is the data model? How does it look like? So each of these are just uh, uh, domains that have different objects that then have different attributes of the type of data that that object has. And then how that object is connected with another object. And looking at that standard aspect that if we think that APIs are very much like those uh, sockets, um, then to, to connect to different application or different software, what the this open standard data model does is helps to uh, avoid creating this type of problem that we have created in history in the physical world and have more of the, the within and between ecosystems to type of standard that Wi-Fi or mobile networks with roaming has across the globe. So it's really important that uh, the, the, the new things are based on open standard model that are being created. It's important that there's an open standard model to convert, you know, to have an ad adapter to be able to plug in to the old system. Yet, after that plugin, it should connect using the standard. So this is very much a simplified view to considerations of it's not how those APIs are, it's what is the interoperability uh, considerations for that and having that in the data model. And then as such, the APIs is an is a automatic side product of that. But if the starting point is the legacy, the current thing, then it's more about building adapters and making the data available based on the standards model. And then a logical data structure from the data model is basically, it helps common understanding of the business data elements and requirements. Uh, it provides a foundation for designing database facilitates avoidance of data redundancy and trust prevent data and business transaction inconsistency, facilitates data reuse and sharing, decreases development and maintenance time and cost. So since using GraphQL as the tool and the design uh, language for data model, it actually the GraphQL schema that is created with as an output of that design is already a logical data structure. So it's one and the same thing. And there, it doesn't need to be uh, other type of design process than designing directly to GraphQL schema. So 
just a few points on the on the GraphQL. It's really the most practical format to maintain the domain model and ubiquitous language for master data models. Many tools to design visual convert between other formats and usages exist. So it really has become the de facto language to, to, to uh, design the data models. It's still a language, so still data models need to be created, but it is the de facto thing to use as uh, also as an adapter language uh, in between the new and the old, as well as between the uh, old and old, if also wanting to make that data available uh, more in the future oriented perspective. So to really understand the depths and details of GraphQL and the whole history, there's an, a, a video available by the one of the part, members of the creating team from Facebook who, where they created this and then made it uh, open to the world as a resource after that. There's also another speech uh, to just to compare GraphQL and REST APIs uh, and, and basically just understanding the differences and benefits of those. They spot they, they also the rest is still useful for many things. It's just a different type of uh, use case and uh, 10x the cost of maintaining documentation and so forth compared to GraphQL. So I'll go through a, an example from our uh, as an our use case. So we have uh, events Shema, and uh, with events Shema we have created this. Um, and a first person, uh, 0 0.1 person uh, using the events domain uh, as an MLE for um, events data. And here we basically have uh, the data model uh, visualized. We have event profile uh, object, we have assets object, we have event location object, we have event organizer object, and then we have a version. And each of these have then different attributes that belong to these different objects. And this is basically then how that uh, logical uh, GraphQL SEMA looks like. It's basically a, a developer familiar, um, just a language, a SEMA language. And, and then this can be uh, available and we're making that, that model available as uh, GraphQL SEMA as an op open, open uh, source document. And then from the UI aspect, when we look at developing UIs, we have uh, component-driven development as the core principle. And component-driven development is a development methodology that anchors the build process around components. It's a process that builds UIs from the bottom up by starting at the level of components and ending at the level of pages or screens. So we really have different levels of components like those uh, atoms and um, uh, so forth, it's building block components to build more of these MLE level components and then further into uh, pages uh, full screens. So it really is this type of approach to think about, or you can think of Legos as such, that uh, needing to understand what are the boundaries of the component itself, but uh, any number uh, of, of uh, steps can be made to basically focus on just developing those components effectively as self-containing items. And then using those components in different ways to build different types of user interfaces. So here is a uh, snapshot of the events um, components. And basically here you can see different building blocks. Uh, so smaller components used to compose a more full event listing component. And then also how that component looks in a mobile interface and interacts. It's, it's the same component with responsive design. And also that uh, mobile event listing component can be added to any number of applications uh, to indicate a, a list of events, for example, in an e-learning app. 
while then uh, this component can be simply replicated to list different types of uh, events. So the content and data can change uh, while there's still uh, just one component repeated and, and information is changed uh, in each of the listing items. And then a couple of other uh, components there as well. And with, with functions like expanding for further information. And the same in, in mobile uh, context. So again, a, a great video to go into much more detail, going component driven and, uh, and, and really uh, a very detailed presentation of everything related to uh, these components. And finally, getting the ecosystem data hubs in the context of this. We basically now have established this uh, way of looking at connecting different applications or applications from different organizations into uh, the use of ecosystem data hub using open standard data model and GraphQL, SEMAS and APIs. We'd need only one connection per application to connect to any number of other connected applications. And inside of this data hub, there's a need for common data models, like for things like people and entities, ecosystem support services and activities and so forth. And when we look at the, the more global perspective, there is then the connectivity between these different ecosystems representing different types of focus that the oper ecosystem operator has, like business vertical ecosystem hub, state level ecosystem data hub, regional ecosystem data hub, and so forth, as well as connecting through a global ecosystem hub within and between these ecosystems as well. So one of the aspects that uh, we want to bring here on how this is something like this is set up and how, how to think of ramping up uh, ecosystem data hub type of approach. So we look at uh, the, the key KPI here as an interoperability aspect. So the ability of computer systems or software to exchange and make use of information. So on here, we have basically two uh, dimensions that we can then establish a total coverage within the ecosystem. So how to really follow and track this progress. So we have the data model coverage on one side. So what domains and objects are covered. And then we have on the other side, we have uh, the data usage through the APIs. And then overall, over time, we can look at the timeline aspect of how this uh, uh, kind of a roadmap aspect and progress tracking, how this goes. So basically, it starts from making sure that there is a data model to cover it, that the objects and items in the ecosystem, and then activating uh, the number of uh, data available or APIs where data is flowing, and then basically growing from there, adding more into the data model coverage and adding more of the data to flow in that, uh, in those uh, models. So then uh, looking at some type of metrics like this, where um, there are open standard that keeps developing and then applying that to local model and then seeing how many of, of things are covered and then tracking the usage in those models that have been made available through the hub. And then the other part of this is really related to the user accounts and the user side data. So now we have been talking mostly on the service side. So on the user side, we have then, uh, of course, because of the GDPR and this regulation, uh, the ability for users to make uh, data available for different applications on their terms. So Circle Pass as an ecosystem level user account for individuals, it can be used to enable login to use different applications and share data between different ecosystem applications, where the data is always owned and controlled by the individuals. 
And then uh, using the same logic for circle pass teams, it's an ecosystem level user account for teams. So organizations that can be used to log in and sign up as a team to use different applications and again, make their data portable uh, between those applications. So here, uh, similar solutions, this uh, is similar to uh, Google Workspace, uh, but of course the Google Workspace is, is only for, for Google's own ecosystem uh, primarily and other things are side consideration. So really the, the aspect of, of this is making the data sharing and portability between the services, both for data that I have entered into the system, as well as applications, what have been observed from my behavior, for example, tracking like Google tracks all the search you made and you have your search history. So that's an, uh, observed uh, data. So really making that type of data available uh, with any number of applications uh, and moving that data between different applications. So CirclePass really provides this type of uh, a hub where user is the hub uh, for, for information that uh, uh, they want to and need to be in control because of the new regulation in place in many countries and growing. So on the tools of TechStack, we have product management, design, communication, workflow management, front-end development, and so forth. And here we have collected the list. We'll share this material uh, after the presentation and make it available also on the ecosystemos.com website. But basically we have different tools and templates on, on Google Drive, for communication and workflow management, the recommended uh, tools, the most commonly used tools in, the, in, in, uh, in this space. Uh, the primary tool uh, that has collaboration functionalities built in, single source of truth type of approach for design with APIs and growing ecosystem of different applications to enhance the design side of things. For front-end development, we're using React as the primary uh, tool and then using open source library uh, called Chakra UI as the smallest building block that are then used to build those MLE uh, element components that we will make uh, also open source available. And then Storybook to really help manage uh, the component driven development workflow. And then of course GraphQL um, as, as core for data modeling and the details about, uh, more details about that. And then some of the key GraphQL tools like GraphQL that can, uh, GraphQL Voyager that can be used for visualizing uh, that schema in a very simple uh, uh, action. And then GraphQL Playground uh, that is part of GraphQL now which is basically the automated documentation and, and, and test tool for, for making queries for the GraphQL APIs or designing queries. And then for more on the backend side and specifically for also for business users, in this case for designing a GraphQL SEMA, Graph CMS, and then Hasura specifically for helping to bridge uh, uh, existing databases and expose those as GraphQL APIs. And then hosting uh, or doing more advanced backend uh, Amazon Web Services that also includes tons and tons of different things uh, to run on. In additionally, additional software features and then uh, hosting front end, again, Amazon, Netlify, but there are also many others available, we just need to select uh, some of the key ones that we will communicate in our uh, ecosystem OS setup. And then also Vercel, which uh, provides uh, also front-end hosting. For testing code quality, uh, we have EST Lint. For testing UI components as a, as a designer or a business user, uh, that's true publishing storybooks and then applic automated application testing through uh, user interface 
uh, we have Puppeteer, which is an open source headless browser supported by Google. So for transition solutions, I want to really highlight the, the Hasura that open uh, provides the database conversion to REST uh, or GraphQL, and also uh, provides the, the ability to convert REST to GraphQL as well. And then the robot process automation, I want to highlight a service called RoboCorp that provides an open source uh, tools and sta standards to help uh, uh, developers build software robots to convert uh, legacy solutions data into GraphQL or other APIs. So what we focus on providing in this context uh, as part of that, so the key thing is that we want to provide as much as possible of the stack and information and knowledge for free uh, to help establish and create the ecosystem around uh, ecosystem orchestrators, those who run the ecosystem hubs. So we, in that context, we really focus only on things that others are not really providing, where our ecosystem development expertise matter the most. So we bring the stack that we use in ourselves and in all of the projects in all levels, make that available. And then the area that we focus is helping to develop the open standard data model uh, around that. And then also providing support for those who want to set up and ramp up their own operations uh, where the budgets are placed for first um, you know, proof of concepts or more mature setups uh, and, and wanting to get advisory or support to set this up. So first and foremost, all the res uh, free resources, ecosystem tech stack, related knowledge, open standard data model development, applications, best practices, library, application concepts. And then digital solutions, we provide ecosystem user accounts, uh, concept circle paths for teams and individuals both um, as a software as a service, as well as then uh, if someone wants to uh, operate those as well in their countries or uh, verticals uh, for that as well through us or as partner uh, to our partners. A global data hub, uh, connectivity as a service, uh, ecosystem and applications across ecosystems. So to start as a software as a service, transfer to open locally once having budget and resources. The key really is that there is no hosting for non-global solutions or services for running ecosystem operations, as that really is your business. So it really, we want to enable your business to run your ecosystems and ecosystem data hubs. And then on the ramp up, uh, setup and ramp up consulting, we provide ecosystem application, digital ecosystem design services, uh, business logic and digital business model design, help request for proposals, consulting, templates, supplier evaluation, project delivery, promoting ecosystem applications and connections from one ecosystem to another. But we don't provide software coding that software, that software developers business to build the applications. So only putting these together and helping to set up the operations and run them. So from our roadmap, we want to share basically that we, as mentioned earlier, we are very much data model driven. So public roadmap for open standard data model uh, for domains and objects, starting with event SEMA, active version updates, release and release logs, taking in community inputs and building uh, governance, uh, common governance on top of that. As well as then on the user interface side, establishing common user interface components, open source library and a design system uh, where we are building on existing open source library with ecosystem framework based use cases and needs. And then finally, uh, looking at the core principles 
And in the core principles, uh, we really want to summarize and highlight that everything is based on shape framework and terminology. Interoperability is by design. It's not an afterthought. How do we connect to something else? It's the first thought. It's based uh, uh, domain-driven design and documentation-driven development. So really starting from the data model and documenting that. Uh, collaborative open standard data modeling. So making sure it doesn't get a proper proprietary uh, constraints. Using GraphQL SEMA and API based architecture. Establishing common asset development with reusability and sharing by design and uh, doing everything component driven development where when we get to actual data, the data is always uh, ownership by rightful owners and everything to look with open collaborates, uh, collaboration and proactive data sharing of these uh, services. So really looking at making data available as a primary thought and then considering what limitations do we need to put on that for privacy considerations, for business uh, model considerations and so forth. So as a summary, we have basically to cover these different aspects and some of the key points of the benefits of ecosystem tech stack and some useful reading for domain driven design uh, in Wikipedia, the role of domain driven architecture, GraphQL and so forth for, for really uh, also reading aspect to in addition to those video links shared earlier. So thank you. Uh, that is the material from, from my side. And uh, at this point, I'm happy to take any questions that may be there for, for uh, answering any of the aspects there. Yes, that was, um, thank you, Walter. That was really, really, um, Good content and a and, and lot of lot of information in uh, in uh, one package. And there's a lot of digest and, and very very insightful uh, thoughts. Uh, thanks for that. I'm I'm uh, Matthias Nurmi. Uh, Oscar Oscar needed to jump out for for another call since we are a little bit over time. But I can I can take this uh, walk walk you, walk you through with these uh, questions that we have had like. Uh, so, so we can uh, start for the first one, and uh, it's uh, regarding the AI and, and uh, this eco ecosystem tech stack. So, so there's the first question goes. I am I am curious to know how the OS ecosystem tech stack integrate with the uh, artificial artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and, and deep learning use cases. All right. Yeah, thanks for that. So the key connection I want to establish here in regards to context of uh, using AI or machine learning, uh, whether it's uh, using those services through API uh, from another service or whether that's uh, uh, putting that to run on top of the uh, open data hub or, or so forth. The key aspect of making uh, AI work is the same as uh, what we humans need uh, to establish our thoughts and make decisions is that the more uh, more data we have, so more information we have, the more accurate we that is and the more uh, correct that is, then the better the AI can work as well. So uh, similarly as, as, as human, if we have uh, false information or we have limited information uh, or we have conflicting information, uh, we make poor judgments uh, or based on that. So that's the first and foremost. The other aspect is really the, the volume so that the more data there is at good quality, the better the AI will work. So one of the, the, the things that I want to connect here, uh, the use of AI that we are considering is actually in the context of the events uh, that we have established uh, and are, are going to provide. So uh, a lot of that startup, uh, a lot of that events using in startup ecosystems, uh, basically 
there's a lot of those events globally existing and we're looking to aggregate that information and make it available to, to uh, other ecosystem hubs, for example. But one of the things that in, in, in we have introduced uh, to the markets uh, has the startup development phases. So this way of labeling these events with uh, to what development phase that event is mostly catering for. <clears throat> so that's a good example for a very simple uh, use case need to take uh, events information that doesn't have that label for added value for those who want to know, is it relevant for me if I'm only starting or is it more for when I'm already looking investors or whatnot, um, is to basically use AI to first observe, uh, you know, ourselves or others doing the labeling for data and then using machine learning to, to learn to label those events automatically initially by labeling and then humans correcting when it makes errors. And then over time that machine learning can handle those uh, event information to be able to label them without uh, needing to think about that to the point where someone is creating an event that the system could recommend that maybe you want to use this development phases to promote that. Thanks, Valto, for that. And um, then the next question is, uh, you talked about uh, the softwares with legacies before. So is there ways to move legacy databases and APIs them into the um, uh, ecosystem OS tech stack? Yes, exactly. So key here is uh, two things. One is to have uh, and you have a know of what technology is available and how that is available. So I, I highlighted those couple of examples, uh, uh, mainly the robot process automation for, for when there's no APIs and very old software. Uh, so RoboCorp provides these open source tools and a community of developers who can help with that. Uh, those use cases and then uh, something like Hasura to, to help expose your MySQL or uh, other types of uh, databases or REST APIs to help convert them technology-wise to a newer stack, which is GraphQL. Uh, but then what the other component that is needed is then to what data model format to convert that. And, and that is something to really uh, follow the open uh, data model standard and to, to use that as the adapter information. So whichever data model format exists, uh, taking into consideration to start making that available more through a, a common data model uh, uh, way and that way uh, designing interoperability uh, in, into your uh, solution. Well, thank you, Valto. And uh, actually the next question is, is kind of continuum for, for that. But, um, any, do you have any ideas? Uh, uh, how long such transition or transformation project could take? Yeah, so that, that is very much dependent on the volume of data and the size of the database or not, not the size of the database, meaning the data model in the database, how many different objects and attributes uh, actually include there. The good thing is that you can pretty easily get, uh, have a developer to print out or get a, 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 a fact data how many objects and attributes we have in our database uh, get a visualization from that and get also um, uh, the volume of data that that is it, it holds and basically with that you can get a, a price estimate pretty uh, quickly from uh, many different providers of uh, what would it take to convert that into um, something uh, more modern but overall, uh, those are pretty straightforward things. So uh, meaning that there is very little, um, uh, let's say, complexity involved, uh, specifically the more and more the open standard data model becomes available, because it's basically saying that this is what we have and we want to make this turned into that other thing. And then this is the volume that we have, and those uh, estimates are going to be very accurate, and the work itself is going to be pretty straightforward. So it's definitely nothing to, to worry about. But how long it will take, let's say, for an average CRM system or something like that, 
um, that conversion process maybe uh, let's say uh, with all the communication going back and forward for figuring out and so so forth and verifying some things or making some other adjustments maybe we are talking within in weeks or maximum uh, in in a month month uh, period calendar time but uh, not as as working time thank you and um, we continue with the same topic uh, uh, do you have a, any kind of estimation or any indication of the CapEx budget range required for such a project? So in general, let's, uh, let's, uh, if, if it's not just a conversion, but also to, to uh, launch, let's say, your own first uh, data hub, I would put the budget somewhere uh, for, for a first proof of concept type of thing. I would put something like uh, 25K uh, in, in, in euros and about three months project. Uh, not so much that it will need to take three months. The key is more than, than uh, a lot of uh, knowledge transfer and a lot of learning can uh, make sense to be embedded to all key stakeholders uh, for going through that uh, transition uh, into the mix. So not just doing that as a separate project, but doing that as a uh, collective setup and learning process and then most importantly, also a ramp up process uh, for those who will uh, continue to operate it uh, forward. And then that can time can be expanded if there's, you know, if proof of concept is required for unlocking more budgets and more uh, ongoing operations, then that can be extended to something like uh, next six months. And within, within that time, uh, the local team should be fully capable to operate. Okay, then we have a uh, last question. It's, it's, uh, it's for you that uh, do, do you have any kind of restrictions for uh, where do you operate as a company? Um, not, I mean, uh, can't say for, for all countries uh, and their regulations. Uh, for the most parts, of course, when we talk about the digital world, uh, uh, a lot of the services can be uh, like business can be operated in one place and uh, the solutions can be operating in many different other countries and, and services. That's just the nature of the, the digital economy. But there are, of course, regulations, for example, between uh, moving European citizens uh, data outside of Europe to store. Um, or I can imagine there being a uh, restriction in some of the Asian countries or other countries um, with different types of um, governments in place or, or, or specifically um, that there may be maybe some, some regulations that uh, prevent certain type of uh, openness or, 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 or so forth. But at the same time, um, that's something that, that uh, we anyway see that uh, the governments, specifically for local economy-based uh, ecosystems, um, it's, it's important that uh, the governments have a, a full understanding and in some cases, specifically for certain type of data that they, they, they give their mandate or even uh, some, operate some of their own hubs uh, themselves. So, but technology wise, it's less of a question. It's more of a regulation question. All right, thanks for that. And there came uh, actually one, one more. Uh, do, you, do you assist projects in, in Africa? Yeah, so from, from our perspective, we, we don't choose the markets. The markets typically choose us. So we make the, the knowledge and the tools known and available and then when you know the free solutions or do it yourself type of approach is not enough and assistance is needed then uh, we take on those projects uh, it doesn't matter where they come from what really matters is that the budgets are in place and we are ready to go if the budgets are not yet in place we recommend to build uh, using our free resources uh, to convince the budget stakeholders and, and then we can jump in when actually something uh, can be done. And, and the budget question is more important, it's less important from our involvement. Uh, it's more important to con continue and being able to uh, establish the knowledgeable resources for the 
sustaining the operations that we are actually helping to set up. Thank you, Walter. Uh, now we have covered all the questions and then uh, your presentation. So I think uh, these words is, is good to end this presentation. I want to, behalf of uh, Start Commons, I want to thank you all uh, for participating and uh, thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Walter, for, for this great presentation and uh, uh, stay healthy. Have a good day. Thanks.